So, as Emily mentioned, you know, when most people think about art and they think about science, they, they probably see them as pretty different fields. You might have even heard someone say that a scientist has this well-developed left hemisphere, whereas an artist, an artist must be walking around with this well-developed right hemisphere. Well, not only is that concept of neural dichotomy false, it also paints, in my opinion, exactly the wrong idea about how these fields should interact. Here, I just have, uh, I like to paint in my spare time, but I also like to do a bit of science. And what I'd like to do today is talk about my experiences combining the creative thinking, the abstract thinking that's emphasized in art, with some really challenging problems in neuroscience that we're trying to solve in the lab that I work in. So, the first benefit of combining art with science that I'd like to talk about is the power of abstraction. It's the ability to see something as more than just what it is. I hate to be cliche, but it's the ability to see the forest from the trees. And to do that, I'll tell you about the problem that we're working on. So what we're trying to understand is how the brain integrates really distinct sensory information to produce very specific motor outputs. So consider how you use your own. You might see a coin on the ground and you might grab it, or you might hear the phone ring and you reach out and grab that as well. You've responded to completely different stimuli. I mean, you've heard something or you've seen something that's totally different stimuli, but you've performed very similar motor output. And that's a really interesting question. How can the brain do it? How can it do it so quickly? But it's also a complex question. In fact, it's impossibly complex to try and answer in the human system. And so we need to move to a simpler model, something that has the aspects of the human, but is simpler, is easier to deal with. You've probably heard of lab mice, of lab ma mice, <laughs> sorry, or lab rats. And they're pretty cute, and they're pretty useful. But <laughs> we actually have to move even further from that, because mice still have tons of neurons. We need to move to our friend, the fruit fly. <laughs> this fellow, oh, this is actually a she, sorry. Well, she has around 100,000 neurons in her brain. This compared to the approximately 80 billion each of you have. So 100,000, that's quite a bit easier to work with. Furthermore, even though you do, I imagine, very different things with your neurons, <laughs> <laughs> on, a, on a molecular, on a cellular level, the fly's neurons are connected in remarkably similar ways to the human's neurons. So if we solve a problem in the fly, we gain great insight into how that problem might be dealt with in the human. But you're all astute, you're all observant, you've probably noticed an issue. We can't very well study the fly own. I mean, it, it only has legs. But, <laughs> but what a fly has is a proboscis. A proboscis is the extended feeding organ that folds out of its head and the fly uses it to grab a piece of food. But Flies don't just use their proboscis for food. They also use their proboscis during grooming, during courting behavior. And those behaviors result from different sensory inputs. So just as you use your own in a whole range of behaviors, so too does this little fly use her proboscis in a whole range of behaviors. So we're using the proboscis as a model for the human arm. And the way that I like to think about this is looking at Picasso's Guernica. In this painting, Picasso is capturing the brutality, the terrible nature of the Spanish Civil War. But he isn't trying to do so by capturing every realistic image. He isn't trying to create an exact replica. Instead, he's using a system of simplified shapes. He's using a limited palette, but he's still able to capture all of the intensity of the original scene. And so that's exactly what we're trying to do with our fly proboscis. Now, the next benefit that I've really found of combining a creative mindset with a challenging problem is just that of creative problem solving, of outside of the box thinking and finding new ideas, finding new solutions. And to do that, I'd like to tell you a bit more about the work that we're doing with our little fly. So we've made the jump. It might have seemed 
improbable, but we've made it from the human to the fly. But we now need to go and we need to understand the very basic circuitry that makes up the fly brain. We need to be able to have cell control, single cell control in the fly brain. We can turn on one neuron, see activation of another, and then see activation maybe of a motor neuron and, and some muscle behavior. And then we can start putting that information together and build up these entire circuits, find out how the brain integrates this information on the cell-by-cell -cell level. But to do that, we need single cell control in the fly brain. And this is an enormous problem. I mean, first, how would you ever get remote activation of a neuron? And second, how would you ever be certain that you're activating just one out of 100,000 neurons? That's what we're trying to figure out. I'll talk a bit about the remote activation first. Now, it'll require another leap of imagination, but one that I think you'll be able to get. It requires heat. You can all sense heat, I, I hope, I imagine. <laughs> and you do that using sensory neurons in your, in your fingertips. And in those sensory neurons, you express temperature-sensitive proteins, temperature-sensitive ion channels. And at an elevated temperature, those channels will open, causing a flood of electrical ions. And that flood will create an electrical signal, and your brain will recognize that that neuron's been activated and understand hot, retract hand, going to burn hand. Now, the flies have very similar sensory neurons. They have similar proteins. So what we do is we take the proteins that would normally be found in sensory neurons, and we express them in small numbers of cells deep in the fly brain. And then, I tried to get a video of this, but it's really tough to video flies, I'm sure you can imagine. <laughs> um, and then, you simply take these flies, you move them to a warmer chamber, and you observe the change in behavior. And of course, you do the scientific controls that I'm sure you can all imagine, but doing that, you can find out exactly what activating a single neuron causes, the, the, the change in behavior that it causes. So we've been able to identify neurons that when we express this protein and then heat up the flies, they, they will perform a range of behaviors. They'll extend their proboscis. They'll be unable to retract their proboscis. And all of those are parts of the puzzle. But we still have our issue, specificity. How are we going to be sure that the protein that we're using is expressed only in one cell? Now, this is the realm of genetics. It uses genetic techniques, slight modifications to the fly genome to put the protein into where it might be expressed in those cells. But genetics has traditionally worked by creating expression patterns. This is an example of an expression pattern. It's quite good. Uh, at the top, this is the fly brain dissected out. It's a challenging dissection. You cannot have had any coffee pretty much <laughs> ever. <laughs> but this is the fly brain. And you can see, if you can see, we're, we're targeting maybe 10 neurons. That's pretty good. I mean, 10 out of 100,000, that's pretty good. But we couldn't, build, we couldn't build circuits out of 10 neurons. I mean, which one is actually responsible for any phenotype, for any behavior that we see? And then let's say we had 10 neurons and another set of 10 neurons, and we tried activating both of those. Well, we have no idea how they connect. That's not a circuit. But to solve this problem, we can use a diagram. A diagram that you probably haven't seen at least I hadn't seen since middle school. The Venn diagram. <laughs> we could create a second expression pattern. I mean, this isn't the only one in the fly. We can create thousands. We can create whole libraries of expression patterns. And then there's no reason that we couldn't put a second expression pattern in the same organism. I mean, we could express two different proteins. But maybe instead of expressing two different proteins, we could express two halves of this temperature-sensitive ion channel. And then what we'd get is activation, but only in the places where those patterns intersect. So here, I, I just think this is incredible. We have a second pattern on the right in the middle. And once again, not the best pattern, maybe even worse than the first. But it really only intersects with the first in just a couple small, small areas. So what we've done is we've taken two patterns that weren't all that useful to us before, but by combining them, by splitting our protein in half, by using a really simple Venn diagram, we can get incredibly precise targeting of proteins. And then this, compare this 
combined with our previous technique of thermal activation, gives us the ability to dissect individual circuits in a brain of 100,000. And this is exactly the type of creative problem solving that I think is so necessary in the field of science. I mean, we're taking heat, we're taking sensory neurons, we're taking expression patterns that aren't useful but then are. But doing that, we're able to create an incredibly powerful system. Now, the goal of my talk today wasn't to try and convince you all to go out and become neuroscientists. If you'd like to, though, it's great. It's a really fun field. <laughs> but rather, what I hope I've convinced you of today is that the solutions to problems can sometimes be found in diverse areas. All of the fields that you're in have unsolved problems, have questions that are still being asked. And what I hope I've convinced you of is that by applying the insights from one field to yours, you might find incredible things. Thank you. <laughs>